And I've got 601. Okay, Mary, you're live tonight. Great, thank you. All right, we will call to order Hood River City Council meeting for February 8th. <clears throat> and I'm gonna go ahead and um, read the land acknowledgement and then we'll do the pledge. And first of all, before I do the land acknowledgement this evening, um, I want to thank uh, Kirby Newman Ray from the Hood River News who actually, um, part of these are his words, and I asked him if I could use them, and I have uh, changed them around a bit, but um, I wanna thank him uh, for his succinct um, verbiage. He's very good with words, and so hopefully this makes a little more sense than some of the times I've done the pledge. As we meet tonight, let us all remember that today we are stewards of land that has been home to indigenous peoples for thousands of years before the recent arrival of the European heritage, heritage dominated culture. We honor this land's ancestors as we go about our business today. All right, we'll do the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Um, we have two people who signed up for business from the audience. Um, Carolyn Smale, who wants to talk about uh, middle housing and green space. And then we'll have uh, Scott Sims after that. Carolyn, you're on. Oh, okay. <laughs> three, oh, three minutes. Let me speak. Um, and I listened to the previous presentation, which was very interesting. Um, so I just wanted to um, let the city know that as the city, oh, I'm Carolyn Smale, and I live at 808 Cascade Avenue. And as the city moves forward with the higher density middle housing code, I would like to ask the mayor and the city council to keep in mind the need for parks and green space. We have learned a lot of things during the COVID crisis. And I think one is that it's really important to have walking access to some green space or a park um, for, for everybody. And that it's a necessity and it's not, it's not a luxury. It's something that, that everybody needs. And as the size of our yard shrinks, the need for publicly owned parks of all types and sizes increases. Kids and adults alike need to be able to get out of the house and run around without having to get into a car. I would ask the city to renew its commitment to preserving the existing parks and green space and making an effort to acquire more. As we lose privately owned empty lots that act as bucklers and in some cases places for kids to play and replace them with multiple dwellings, it is more important than ever to preserve and expand our parks and trail systems. But I guess we shouldn't make them too nice as Lorelai said, because then we're gonna increase our middle housing costs and maybe make it not as affordable. So you have a very difficult job of finding a good balance and it looks like you're doing a, a good job at it. So keep up the good work and thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, Scott Sims. Thank you very much, can you hear me? We can hear you, go ahead, you have three minutes. Thank you so much. Well, good evening. My name is Scott Sims and I'm a resident of Hood River in the 700 block of the Oak Street. I'd like to express my concern today for the ever increasing speed of some drivers in downtown Hood River, particularly on Oak and State Streets. And I'm sure excessive speeding is, is certainly up elsewhere in the city as well. So my concern is that even with the posted 20 and 25 miles an hour signs downtown, we're seeing speeding that is much, much higher, unfortunately. There have been fender benders, crashes, and even a recent incident near the library when a pedestrian minor was hit by a car. So thankfully, that accident was not fatal, but the next one certainly could be. So I realize the city has got many obligations coupled with limited resources, and I'd like to spend the rest of my a lot of time today sharing two things. First, I'm really glad to help with this problem of excessive speeding in our community, and I'd be happy to, to rally others <clears throat> to volunteer their time as well. 
And second, there are a number of simple and proven solutions to the city's speeding problems, and there are many safety benefits to them as well. One need only look to White Salmon and Bingen across the river, two communities which have, one, extended their 20 mile an hour and 25 mile an hour corridors. They've added automated slowdown signs when these posted speeds are exceeded. And they've stepped up police patrols and ticketing for speeding infractions. In short, their system is working and Hood River should consider similar steps. Furthermore, the addition of stop signs that create four-way stops, particularly on Oak Street and State Street, might be another way to aid in slowing traffic while boosting the safety of kids, seniors, tourists, and others. It may also discourage those drivers from trying to move through the city center uh, quickly to instead choose the freeway. It's very rare, as you know, for a town the size of Hood River to also have a freeway that parallels the downtown corridor and has good access points at either end. As well, we know from observing drivers and pedestrians downtown during busy periods that there is regular confusion at the intersections such as 3rd, 4th, and 6th streets on Oak about whether it's a through street or a four-way stop. We could make it easier for pedestrians and drivers by just adding stop signs so there is no specter of doubt or confusion. There's also a societal benefit by lowering and enforcing vehicle speeds in our cities. It actually builds a safer community. Since we all care about the quality of life we have here in Hood River, Here's something to think about for our loved ones, friends, coworkers, and visitors. The Insurance Institute for Highway Safety recently reported that a pedestrian struck at 25 miles per hour has 25% chance of being seriously injured, but that climbs to a 50% chance at 33 miles per hour. Importantly, lower speed limits also reduce the number of crashes as an Insurance Institute study found in 2018. I wanna thank all of you for your service to the community and for hearing my concern here tonight. As well, again, I am volunteering to help should the city want to tackle this problem of making the Hood River downtown streets safer for all of us uh, for, from those who drive carelessly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate it. All right. Um, so we have a presentation um, from Beatrice Lynch on Safe Space Children's Advocacy Center of the Gorge. And that'll be next. If you want to promote her, Jonathan. Madam Mayor, I don't see a, a Lynch last name. Hmm. Uh, Jonathan, it could be Beatrice. Oh, I'm sorry. Here we go. She has a presentation, so she's being promoted to panelist here. Okay, thanks. Okay, I think I've got myself unmuted and up and running. Good evening. My name is Beatrice and I am the director of Safe Space Children's Advocacy Center, formerly known as Columbia Gorge Children's Advocacy Center. Um, we have been open since 2009, um, and we serve five counties now, Hood River, Wasco, Gillum, and Sherman, and we have a small contract with Click Attack County across the river. And we are the one-stop child abuse assessment center. What that means is that children will come to us, and we work with, uh, we have a couple of medical doctors that help us do the medical exams for children. We have forensic interviewers. Um, we have our community partners that come to the center um, to meet with the, the child and the family so that we can do the interview, the forensic interview, and it's recorded and all the parties that need to have information, DHS is looking for information for the safety of the child and law enforcement is looking to see if a crime was committed. Um, we're able to do the interview at one time and hopefully get all of those questions answered that you know both of those agencies need to know. Um, if the, the child needs a medical exam, they can get a medical exam with us. Um, we also have an advocate that works with the family that is there from the very beginning and then we'll follow the case, whether it uh, goes to trial or just uh, hearing, whatever the, the end of the case is that the family advocate will follow that, that case and that child uh, until the end of the case. We do referrals to mental health. Um, we don't have mental health in our office right now, but we do have a contract with a local mental health provider that specializes um, in children with trauma. Um, so we do referrals to that um, counselor. Um, let's see what else. 
before we existed, um, this is probably something that you guys don't know about, but before we existed, children were often uh, seen at the ER um, where, you know, well-meaning nurses would come and ask the child, what happened, honey? And then the doctor would come in and say, what happened? Uh, intake specialist would be like, you know, what happened? And multiple times the child would have to be telling their story over and over again. And then came DHS and they would need to interview the child and then law enforcement would have to interview the child. So it was multiple times, the multiple times the child was being traumatized. So what an advocacy center does, it brings all of these folks into one place so that all of their questions are being answered there. And hopefully it will eliminate the times that children have to keep talking about what happened to them and the healing can actually begin to, to, to happen. Um, we are one of 20 centers in the state of Oregon um, and we serve a great big area, not a lot, large population, but a big area. Um, and we struggle like any other small center um, in Oregon. We struggle with funding because we don't have a doctor in-house. We contract with our doctors, which means that still kids will often not have access to the center or to that medical doctor and still have to go to the ER to be seen, which is not ideal. Um, as far as the cost, um, our cost to do like the full assessment is just a little over $2,400. That includes the medical, that includes the interview, that includes the, the, um, the referrals to mental health, it includes our advocate following that child. And you all know that if the child ends up at the ER, they're not leaving the ER under $5,000, regardless of what happens. And honestly, the ER docs don't want to see child abuse victims there. They don't feel like they have the training for it. They don't see enough of the cases. And things get missed. So it, they support us, not financially, but they support the work that we're doing. Um, what else can I tell you? Um, I, I don't know how much to tell you because I don't know how much you guys all know about what we do. So I can keep talking or if you guys wanna ask me a question, go ahead. Well, I, um, we're thinking about, the, or there's a possibility that your center might be able to be uh, co-located with a new um, safety center, police center, and maybe the county would be involved in that too, and we'll be investigating that later this year. Um, but how, maybe you could tell us, you're just uh, bursting out of where you are now, or could you tell us more about your space needs a little bit? Sure. So we uh, started out um, in the uh, duplex, I think it's a duplex that um, Helping Hands has, we occupied the bottom floor of that uh, for seven years. And then in 2017, we moved up to our current place on, uh, off of Woods Court or in Woods Court. Um, and we occupied 1,300 square feet. So we've quickly outgrown it uh, with one medical room and an interview room and then office space right now. And so we're kind of at a crossroads where we're almost able to hire like a medical director to be in staff medical director, but we don't have the room for them right now, honestly, even if we have the money to hire them right now. So we are looking that we're going to expand um, our services, hopefully bring in mental health to be in, inside our, of our center and be part of the team that assesses. So we're quickly outgrowing our center. Um, oh, I just had a thought that I was going to share with you. Um, it'll come back to me. Go ahead. I think, Tim, did you have your hand up? Um, I was just going to comment that as much information as you're, you feel like you should share would be great, great for me. OK. So tell us everything. So, OK. So we'll start. Uh, so we get our referrals from law enforcement or DHS when there's a report of a child that's being abused uh, or the suspicion of abuse. Um, they will call me uh, and we will set up an assessment and I usually will get our team together, uh, which includes our medical, our forensic interviewers, um, law enforcement and DHS are part of the team. Uh, they need to be in the building when we're interviewing because we're, we don't work for either of those agencies. Our services are neutral because we will rule in just as much as we rule out abuse. So that's why we don't, uh, we are very neutral. It's a neutral place for, for families to come in. So they come in, um, we do, we're small enough that we're focusing on one family, one child at a time. Our team is there for that one child. Um, we do the assessments, um, which includes the forensic interview that is recorded, um, and then the medical exam. We have two doctors that work with us right now, Dr. Robin Henson, 
Um, she's retired and she's doing this in her retirement. And then Dr. Glenn Patrizio, um, there, there are two medical doctors that hopefully give us pretty good coverage, not full 24 seven like we need, but pretty good coverage. Um, and then we have a family advocate that is there as well. So that's kind of the, the routine, how, how that works. Um, I see a hand up, Gladys, you wanna? Yeah, do you offer services in both English and in Spanish? Absolutely, yes. Um, we have a, uh, I'm one of the forensic interviewers and I'm bilingual, bicultural, um, and we have two other interviewers as well. Um, so yeah, we do. I think we, all our resources for the most part, um, we just changed our name to Safe Space, so I'm still working on translating all of our materials into Spanish, but we, yes. What about medical providers besides the two that you mentioned? Is there anyone else that's uh, bilingual? No, Dr. Hansen speaks pretty good Spanish. I mean, she's been a physician in this area for a long time, and, and she actually, her Spanish is pretty good. Um, so no, we don't. And that's a big, that's a big issue for, for our area because we had a really hard time finding medical providers that would do this work. Um, when we started out, we had a, a pediatrician that worked with us for probably six years. And I think we really burned her out. Um, so it, it was hard. It was hard for about a year that we didn't have a medical provider. And you know, what I always tell people is that I, my standard is that I want to be able to have the same standard of care for children in our communities that we serve as the kids that are abused in Multnomah County. Multnomah County and you know, the other big areas have huge, beautiful centers that provide all of this wonderful service to uh, child abuse victims. I want that same level of care for our kids. And I don't care if you're a kiddo in Wheeler County or in Multnomah County. Your care when you come to a CAC should be the same. And so that's what I'm striving for. And it's, um, it's a challenge because we have less resources than those, those folks. But I think banding together, it gives us a bigger voice. Um, so I, I see some other hands. Um, Megan? I'm gonna kind of jump on what you were talking about with resources, but um, if you could talk about where your funding comes from, is it is it the families, you know, covering that uh, two thousand no. dollars, or is it uh, you know from the state or grants or a um, mix or? Yeah, that really good question. Um, no, families are never charged for any of our services at all. So we get our biggest funding from what is called a CAMI funding, and that's a funding that the state of Oregon has and that gives back out to the, each of the counties to use for child abuse investigations. Each county gets a, a certain amount and Hood River County for the last five or six years have opted to give us all of their CAMI, CAMI funding. We contract with Wasco County and they use their CAMI fundings for this as well. And so does uh, Gillum and Wheeler County. Um, it's a little different uh, process in, in Washington state. So that's our biggest funders. We also get victims of crime um, funding. Those are federal monies, um, VOCA, they're called VOCA funding. We do get some VOCA funding, but we do a lot of, of fundraisers. Um, this past year was really hard because we couldn't do any of our fundraisers. We still have a garage sale, everybody. I mean, that's, that's how grass, grassroots our, our movement was at the very beginning. We still have a garage sale that doesn't, you know, gives us, you know, $1,000 maybe a year, but it's also a really good way to connect with the community. Um, so yeah, we rely on grants and, and fundraising and donations. The county money that you get that's specifically for your program, is it attached to the health department in any way in the funding that they get? No, it's not. It's totally different. Okay. Um, a lot, a lot of uh, counties, um, the, the CAMI, CAMI funds go through their district attorney's office. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, Tim, did you have your hand up or? I did, uh, Megan actually asked my question, but I'll, I'll follow up on that, uh, that thread. Um, so with respect to your costs, how does, is rent a significant cost for you? Yes, rent is a significant cost. I mean, you all know what rent costs around here. Um, mm -hmm. We occupy 1,300, a little over 1,300 square feet and we pay $2,500 for that space beautiful space and we love it. Um, but yeah, it, it, it is. It, it's definitely a, a big factor. Thank you. Mark? Beatrice, thank you for doing what you do. It's yeah. just beyond me to, to grasp how important it is. So, but thanks. Um, I, I see the website 
uh, shows a National Children's Alliance, and I was just wondering what's What's the connect? Do they fund you a little bit, I hope? and They provide some grants. Um, there mm -hmm. are some grant opportunities through the National Children's Alliance. The, the NCA, what they do is they accredit centers. Um, so we're not an accredited center. And I believe in Oregon, there's only about mm, under 10 centers that are accredited. Uh, I, I'm not sure about the exact number. Um, but no, we, we don't, we, they don't normally do any a, a lot of funding for us, um, but we do, we can write for some grants specifically for projects. So, you know, if we had a project in mind, we could ask for some money from the NCA. But they provide an umbrella that's useful for you guys? Is that They provide a lot of trainings, um, a lot of information, a lot of research, because a lot of our, our the, the way we practice and do interviews is research-based. So they provide a lot of trainings for us. Uh, our interviewers do peer reviews quarterly. We have lots of Unfortunately, this year have all been Zoom trainings, which I don't find as rewarding as, you know, going in person, but they provide a lot of support for us through that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Oregon also has a network of, of child abuse centers. It's called the Oregon Child Abuse Solutions. And so they kind of coordinate all of us. Um, there was a House Bill 2826 that is um, hope, hopefully will be picked up uh, this year in the uh, in Salem. And we're asking for some line item budget uh, funding for centers, specifically for centers, because we've never been uh, funded through the state. Great. Um, any other questions from anyone? Uh, Gladys? Bethany, we're talking about, you know, what it would look like to merge both city and county police departments and potentially you. So, can you just, uh, what would that look like to you? How would it be structured? Um, I haven't had a lot of discussions about joining the county as well, but I think it's a great idea. I mean, to have like a justice center. Um, there's other models. Utah has a great model of having all of their juvenile department, DA, um, law enforcement, and children's advocacy centers all in one building. Um, so what Neil and I had talked about is that we would share space and there would be some common areas that we could share. They need an interview room that they can inter interview victims, not interrogation rooms, but a different type of interview room that we have. Um, so there's that possibility of sharing space in that way. Um, and also for us, I mean, sometimes parents aren't very happy to be bringing their kids here. And even though we don't let the perpetrator or the, the alleged perpetrator come into an uh, interview or an assessment, sometimes we have the parent that's not being protective test, texting the, the other parent. And um, we have a safety issue a little bit sometimes. So being that close to uh, law enforcement would give us some, some security as well. Uh, but it's also, I think it's a really good partnership. I mean, we, law enforcement is one of our biggest partners. Did that answer your question or did I go down a different <laughs> Any additional questions? I don't see any. I would like to invite you all to come see our center. Um, we've been in this community uh, for 11 years and not a lot of people know us. So hopefully the name change will, will be a little bit better. It'll be easier to remember. Um, but we also are doing some wonderful work that I would love for to, to share with you all. Um, it's great that you haven't been in my center. That means you're, you, you're, you and your family haven't needed our services, but at the same time, you have no idea the work that we're doing. And um, it's pretty impressive, the team that we've put together. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, really, yeah. really appreciate it. Um, I have a, a one, qu one more question for you. Um, I'm gonna be speaking on Radio Tierra and you know about probably about, about the uh, city work plan because we, we just have put that together but if there's any extra time i don't have you been on radio tierra or has someone from your group been there not for a while um i think we have in the past but we haven't been there for a while and that's part of our outreach this year as we're like launching our new name and really trying to make ourselves known in the community that's one of our, the areas that we're going to be looking into okay. now. Well, if I have an opportunity, if I could just mention your name and that you do have those oh, yeah. services and they are bilingual, then I would just give you guys a plug that your services are available. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, really you bet.
Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. All right, um, that is the end of our presentation. And so we don't, we don't have anything on work session, but I'm gonna go ahead and open the work session. And do we have any ad um, agenda additions on that? We don't have anything right now. No, no. ma'am. No, okay. All right, so I will go ahead and adjourn the work session. Then we'll open the regular council meeting. Um, do we have anything, any additions or corrections on that? No, we do not. Okay. Um, we have a consent agenda. Um, and I don't know that we, we have, I'm just gonna list off for people that are listening that can't see what's what we're going to be approving here. Council meeting minutes, Oregon Public Works Cooperative Assistance Agreement, fee waiver request from Gorge Grown for Farmer's Market, um, uh, F-35 vehicle replacement, and the acceptance of the Urban Renewal Agency Annual Statement. Unless someone, uh, Mark's got maybe a question, go ahead. Yeah, I did. I, I noticed it for the gorge grown thing. There's a there's a motion in there. It, my assumption is that we're just going to agree to waive the fees for this year, like we have the last couple of years. Is it, um, versus, I, I know in the past Hannah's come and given a presentation and and stuff, and uh, I'm I'm hip with it being on the uh, consent agenda. I do want to just say publicly that. I'm supportive of the Gorge Grown and the Farmer's Market and what they've been doing down there. Um, so go get them. Great. Thank, thank you, Mark. Yeah, I, that is the intent of having it on the consent agenda is that we would approve it. Um, Eric? If I could just build on what Mark just said. Um, and this is rewinding a little bit and earlier in the COVID phase and Mayor, I think I actually remember seeing you down there. There was a lot of concern early on about farmers market having the farmers market during COVID. And I, I just think that organization really deserves um, kudos for the bravery might be too strong of a word, but there was just a different mindset back then and people were really nervous and they did it the right way. Uh, and I remember there's a lot of Facebook discussion, which is often not the best place to have meaningful discussion. And I just want to give kudos to that organization for the way they handled that. Uh, so I want to join Mark's comments there. Thank you, Eric. Gladys? I just want to echo my peer sentiments. Uh, Sarah Sullivan and Hannah Ladwood, you've done a tremendous job of leading this organization and really helping um, food stay local. 98% of the food that's grown here is exported elsewhere um, in the country and worldwide. So Sarah and Hannah, thank you for all the work that you do. I also just wanted to mention last year I was on the board during this time and I just wanted to publicly announce I'm no longer, there's no, there's no uh, conflict of interest in any way. Thanks Gladys. Yeah, I did go down early on, as Eric said, or the, the first time they opened, they opened a little early and they were being extremely cautious. And um, I applaud that they, you know, they were giving a match for people that were using SNAP and it was $10 and now it's 15. So, um, and they're able to do that because of, of us and the city um, helping them with that, with the fees. So um, I think we all, are nodding our heads here. <laughs> I think it's a good thing. Um, could I get a motion for the consent agenda? So I will move we approve the consent agenda. I'll second. Megan has made a motion and Gladys has made a second to approve the consent agenda as um, presented. Um, any discussion? Um, roll call vote, Eric? Aye. Mark? Yes. Tim? Aye. Jessica? Aye. Gladys? Aye. Megan? Yes. And chair votes aye. All right. Um, thank you so much. The regular business items, we have a second quarter financial performance report from Will. Yes, thank you, uh, Honorable Mayor and City Council. Uh, we have the quarterly uh, financial report to present to you tonight, this is with six months of uh, uh, 
financial data through the first half of the, uh, so we're one half of the way through the fiscal year and things really firm up uh, quite a bit uh, going from the first quarter to the second quarter. Uh, one of the biggest things is when, our, uh, when we do the first quarter report, uh, no property taxes come in yet. And by this report, 93% of what we're gonna receive is usually in, in the bank. And so uh, particularly with a sort of unique situation of pausing urban renewal uh, funds and calculating that out ahead of time, you know, we were confident in, the, in those uh, calculations, but it was uh, just very affirming to see uh, the, the money actually come in and that we're even exceeding uh, slightly what, we're, uh, what we budgeted for property tax. Um, you know, one thing that always gets people uh, gets people's eye on this report. So I want to every time uh, uh, I bring uh, the quarterly report to you, just hit on uh, the the uh, fall in fund balance that's happening this year, and just uh, you know reiterate that that's from uh, planned investments paying down liabilities. Um, so the biggest piece is the PERS side account. And so that's basically taking money out of our checking and putting it into a retirement account, so to speak. Uh, uh, it uh, is set aside to adjust our benefit in a PERS and uh, PERS managed uh, account, uh, which in 2020 earned 7.66%. Uh, and it, uh, in doing so, we also obtained a 25% match. So in, in total, uh, we, put in $1.6 million and got uh, just over $400,000 from the state of Oregon. Um, and that $736,000 uh, you see as an expense in the general fund is the general funds proportionate share uh, of contributing to that total citywide 1.6 million. And then the, the second biggest one-time expense is uh, paying down compensated uh, absence, uh, absence liabilities that has accrued over many, many, many years uh, in our fire and EMS. Um, so that was part of the fix that uh, came along with this newest collective bargaining agreement that was approved is uh, changing the way that those compensated absences accrue in the future and getting rid of, of the old uh, liability that had accrued. So um, while you're uh, seeing the cash balance drop, it's, it's really because we're, we're putting money away and saving it, not that we're spending it. So uh, removing all of those one-time expenses and also the one-time revenues from us, uh, pausing the urban renewal uh, division of tax. I estimate that we're running about a $350,000 operating deficit this year, uh, which is in the single digits, uh, you know, relative to the size of our budget and, you know, not bad at all considering a, you know, once in 100 year uh, global pandemic that has really hit our uh, discretionary uh, revenue sources uh, really hard. Uh, lodging taxes for the last couple of months has been about 25% down from normal and uh, municipal court and parking revenues uh, stubbornly down about 45%. Um, and so this, and this projection and uh, through the end of the year, it just expects that to continue on. Uh, and we're still doing we're still doing very well uh, with uh, a strong uh, fund balance going into uh, 21 uh, Just one other non-COVID type thing to note um, that uh, state marijuana tax is going to be significantly uh, reduced going forward. Only about half of the impact is hitting this fiscal year, but the League of Oregon Cities expects state marijuana tax to reduce by a little over 70% going forward. Uh, the result of a voter initiative, uh, decriminalization voter initiative that redirected a lot of the state's uh, marijuana tax to um, treatment centers. And that's going to be about a $38,000 hit uh, in uh, next year when we get a full year of it being uh, declined. But really important to note, uh, that does not impact our local, local marijuana tax. Um, so that's I have a question on that one, Will. So you sure. said 38000 on that. Mm -hmm. So is that money that we would have gotten back from the state somehow? Okay. Yep, exactly. Mm -hmm. They pass through. Uh, same way we get uh, some pass through of, of state gas tax comes to us. We also get a, a bit of the state marijuana tax uh, comes through to us. Yeah, that 38000 is going to go for treatment services, but we won't 
really know if it's going to th be thirty-eight thousand dollars worth of treatment services for Hood River County or the City of Hood River's need. It's just in a big pot. In a big pot. I know that they are supposed to be regional. I don't know if every county uh, gets one or if it goes more like ODOT regions. Um, we can look into that for the City Council. I'm not exactly sure where all the treatment centers are going to be. And I, I think it's going to take several years to get them stand up, uh, stood up as well. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that, is, in broad brushes, is uh, kind of the financial trends and state of things right now. i uh, be happy to answer any questions that the City Council has. Um, Jessica? I did have a question. Thank you for your report, Will. It's always really helpful. Um, it does look like the, the police budget is really under, um, and that's when you didn't mention. Can you... Explain what's going on there. Sure. Yeah, we've had some uh, persistent vacancies in there, uh, really attributable to uh, COVID-19, slowing down, you know, uh, the process to fill those vacancies. So um, hiring a police officer is already a very long process with background checks, lots of references, um, you know, psych evaluation, and then layer the uh, COVID-19 pandemic over that. And it's just really hard to get uh, you know, the necessary appointments scheduled and, um, you know, we've all seen it just in everything over this past year, just how everything has slowed down to a crawl, um, trying to get things done sometimes. So uh, that's uh, uh, two different vacancies just being hard to fill there. Mm -hmm. Mark? Thanks, Will. Um, Couple of questions. One is, you know, municipal court revenue is down. Is is there with the expenditures seem to be, you know, approaching fifty percent? Is are there offsets we need to do in the second half of the year just with expenses, or is it just gets absorbed with the um, contingency and and your cash for per department shortages? Yeah, the, what this is projecting out with the year end estimates to close is. Kind of if it continues to trend like this, what is the math going to say? And it says we're going to go into the next fiscal year with, a, with about $2.5 million, which I think is, um, uh, you know, and, and, op, and municipal court down versus everything up, down, and all netting out to about a $350,000 operating deficit. $350,000 operating deficit with $2.5 million in, in, in the bank. Uh, and still so much uncertainty, uh, still recommendation not to make any, uh, not to make any permanent adjustments. Yeah. Sure. Seeing what the revenue picture um, stabilizes at. Right. And, and, you know, we had talked about that and have these, you know, the next things that we have, strings we have to pull if we have to pull them. So, uh, and then my other, my other question is just, I, I don't think I understand franchise, the sources of franchise fees and why it would be down. So if you could give it a, two-sentence primer on that, that would be great. Sure. Um, so you'll see it on a lot of your utility bills. Anyone who, uh, any company out there, uh, you know, power, cable, uh, uh, telephone, uh, garbage, any of those um, utilities uh, that need to use our public right-of-way uh, to conduct business, they pay a percentage of their revenues uh, to us. So, uh, and it's all different percentages and it's based on our franchise agreements, um, which come uh, to city council for approval um, or just based on our municipal code setting certain like um, telecom is 7%. Right. Um, but which so, ones are, I would think those are all sort of steady things and, but it's down, you know, 20% or almost 20%. So. Yeah, um, pretty steady. Um, but uh, when their revenues decrease, and I, I haven't actually looked at, you know, is, um, are the internet companies doing worse than the garbage company or I, which one is driving the downward trend. Yeah. Um, but just when when those companies make less money, uh, less is remitted through. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Will? Okay, um, we have a, I think it's a motion on page 45, just it's a recommendation to accept the report on page 45. And I just got a text from Tim, he's having some internet issues. 
um, him personally, I guess his internet is having a problem. I don't know if there's anything Jonathan can do, but I've texted um, Tim to and ask him that question. So there may not be anything we can do to help him get back on right now. Does someone want to make a motion? Mayor, we can certainly accept a motion, um, but it, it's not required for you this. Don't need to. Okay. Right. All right. There's Tim. <laughs> Great. We got him back. All right. So we, we don't need a motion on that. It's just uh, um, inform informational. Um, department heads. Let's see. Um, Rachel, do you have anything? Specific? I don't have anything. And um, I haven't heard that anybody does, although I will let them jump in if they do. Okay. I'll just call on people and see. Um, uh, Chief Holstein, do you have anything? I will say, um, Councillor Meta, we are we did a, give a final offer to an individual. Uh, she comes out of Seattle Police Department, and her starting date will be the 16th of this month. So we will have that position filled, and we're still working on the retirement position from Andy Frazier. So good news. Right. And as Will, as Will said, it's going very slow with the COVID and medical evaluations and such. So and working through some people, you know, been had a career in the military, and that takes quite some time now with COVID. So. Great. Thank you. To clarify, Chief Holsty, you said she as in she is a female officer? She is a female, yes. Great. Great. Um, Dustin, do you have anything? Uh, nothing new, Mayor. Thank you for taking another hour of your life, though, earlier to uh, to listen to Lorelai. We really appreciate um, the opportunity to share with our colleagues, and we appreciate you taking extra time out as well. So thank you all. Great. Um, Mark, Janik? Yes, Mayor. Do you have anything tonight or not? Um, this, this is relative to the um, mutual aid? No, it, no, just in general, just, just does public works have anything they want to let city council know about that's, you know, a big thing coming up or, you know, something like that? Oh, no, I, I've got nothing except uh, beware uh, later this week. Looks like there's some snow coming. So everybody be careful. Hopefully it'll just be a dusting. Um, other than that, um, nothing major coming up. Great, thank you, thank you. And um, to remind anyone that's listening, um, we do have a snow plan, snow plow plan for the city and uh, certain sides of the streets you're not supposed to be parking on um, when we need to plow those. So I believe we have that um, up on the city website. So uh, please pay attention to that so we can get things plowed if we do, do have a little bit bigger storm and we need to plow. Um, Chief Damien, do you have anything? I have nothing to add. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, great. Um, Landmark Marks Board Member Reappointment. So we have two um, people who've been on the Landmarks Board, Cindy Walbridge and Scott Sorensen. And um, we've basically had um, ongoing openings for some time. We have another opening besides their positions that has been open and we've been um, trying to get people, but nobody signed up. And um, Cindy Walbridge and Scott Sorensen have um, indicated that they would like to continue sitting on the uh, Landmarks board. And so um, I, I'm happy to have them. They've been on it quite some time and they're very familiar with um, the city. Of course, most people know that Cindy used to be our uh, planning director. And so, um, and Scott Sorensen is a, a solar uh, panel in installer. So there's a recommendation on page um, 47, and I'd like to reappoint them, but I need, if I could get someone to read that uh, motion. Um, I move to request the mayor reappoint Cindy Walbridge and Scott Sorensen to the Landmarks Board for three-year terms. I'll second that. 
All right, Megan has made a motion and Mark has seconded the motion. Um, all those in favor, uh, Mark? Yes. Jessica? Aye. Gladys? Aye. Tim? Aye. Megan? Yes. Eric? Aye. All right. Great. Um, we will, you, you are solely going to be appointed then, um, both Scott and Cindy. Thank you for your service, both of you on the Landmarks Board. Um, council call. Um, let's see here. Eric? Sure, Mayor. I um, would like to report to the group on the meeting that I participated in last week, Monday, for the Region 1 ACT Committee. This is the Area Commission on Transportation Committee that um, I serve on in relation to ODOT and uh, also serve with Chairman Oates of the County Commission, Jess Groves, who is part of the Port Commission in Cascade Locks, and John Davies, uh, local business person that's a business person representative. It's actually, a, it was a fascinating meeting, and I don't, it's hard to say that because it's ODOT, but it really was. If I could just report on two things about it. Uh, first, the, um, there was a discussion about the, well, let me step back. So it just always helps me to remind you what this ran myself what this committee even is so the act committee is one of several act committees around the state that give um, non-binding input to the oregon transportation commission which is the big decision making body in the state of oregon as concerns transportation so anyway um the uh oregon transportation committee approved this giant budget of $2.1 billion. Um, and I'm gonna actually, can you guys see that? So this is a screen share of a screen share, I think. This is from my cell phone I took during the meeting last Monday. But um, this has been approved for this bucket of money that at least this committee somehow touches. Now there's multiple buckets of money that ODOT has, but this is $2.1 billion and the one that's most notable for us is the local programs because that's the bucket that we can most easily draw upon. And uh, our, our jurisdiction is with Clackamas and Multnomah County. So we're sort of the small rural county that's clumped in with the Portland Metro. And the biggest category is the fix it category, 800 million. And as, you, as you've heard me say before, uh, it's hard for Hood River County to get into those fix it dollars because those are, and this is my slightly op-ed, but I think people would agree with this who are, more knowledgeable than I. Um, because we're a rural area, it's hard for us to tap into the fix it projects, which are kind of by formula program to more high needs area as, as is driven by population and traffic. And as a rural area, we just are less for that. Um, and there's been less and less dollars going to Hood River. Um, but it, it did appear from the presentation because the people in our group from Hood River have been really trying to advocate for uh, an awareness of the um, Oregon Transportation Committee that because of the formulas, Hood River County is getting less and less dollars. So it, I don't have anything specific to report other than they apparently received that message. There is $4 million for local programs. And these, this is the bucket that hopefully we will be drawing upon. For, and by the way, the time frame for this budget is 2014 to, excuse me, 2024 um, to 2027. So this is kind of really looking forward. But for things like, and we had to talk a little bit about this at the last meeting about things like uh, safe routes to school. Hopefully Hood River County can get some of that $4.4 .4 million to help fund safe routes to school and say Odell. It's been on the list for a while to have a safer um, pedestrian area for kids around the railroad track near, um, uh, near Mid Valley. So that budget was approved. There was a lot of discussion around that. Uh, around a, a reinvigorated focus for ODOT around non-highway spending. This apparently, proportionally speaking, is the biggest percentage of a step bucket that is around things other than highways and things like multimodal uh, and safe routes to school. So it all sounded good. We'll see when the rubber meets the road if Hood River County can participate in some of these um, discretionary projects as much as we have in the past. There is less and less money going around, but um, those are the, the numbers that um, the Oregon Transportation Committee approved at a recent meeting. 
And then the second thing, if I could mention, and this was fascinating to me, and I know we're at Hood River, we're kind of not part of the Portland metro area, but I think this will impact Hood River's relationship with Portland, and that is tolling is coming to, um, to the Portland metro area. And specifically, um, around the, in Oregon City, there's a, it's called the Abernathy Bridge around 205. There's going to be tolling around that zone. And then there's a seven-mile stretch of I-5, I think Going Street on the north side, south to uh, Multnomah Street, just south of Portland, there's going to be a, a toll system like you would see in California or Delaware or wherever. And um, there's a big focus, and there was an hour and a half presentation on this, but let me just give it to you in 60 seconds on the desire of ODOT, and they have a committee that's reviewing this, and it's not this committee, it's a different committee, to really have as an equitable and fair tolling system as possible. Um, and they are asking for our input. So if anybody has any ideas on how to make sure this tolling system is fair, I know it's far removed from our city, but um, people from our community go to the Portland all the time. And I, the first thing that came to my mind was agriculture and our, our, our shipping agricultural products that might be subject to trucks and tolling. And um, that's just an idea that came to mind, but we have an opportunity for input. It's gonna be a very expensive tolling system. The system itself, just the system to install the, the you're probably gonna be the overhead cameras or whatnot to take pictures of your license plate. It's expected to cost between 300 and $400 million just for the system, which means that the community doesn't draw any money until $401 million. So we're gonna invest 400, it just seems like an outlandish amount of money. But I'm not criticizing that, I'm just pointing out the investment that's gonna go into this tolling system. But three to $400 million just to build it out and then have the tolling. And then the other thing is, it's, this was very, this was unequivocal. The, the money raised is going to stay in the Portland Metro area. And I should have done a share screen of this. There's a, they're they're gonna put um, freeway covers. I, if you can imagine this, it sounded like unreal. They're gonna put freeway covers over parts of, um, I-5 around the Rose Quarter, which sounds great because I think they'll use that for open space and maybe some green space. That part of Portland could really use some more green space. And I'm not sure if there's going to be a commercial use or not, but there's this really neat futuristic drawing of covers over I-5 around the Rose Garden. And the Rose Garden improvement is a whole big project that ODOT has. But what I'm trying to communicate is that Tolling is coming, the, it's gonna be expensive on a grand level and the money's gonna stay in Portland. Um, but there's these neat ideas for freeway covers among many other things. Um, so it was a fascinating presentation, um, but that's my, um, that's my summary of it. Eric, uh, freeway covers is something I've never heard of before. Is that like the highway becomes a tunnel and, okay. Yeah, there's, um, you know, I might be able to find a picture of it if you give me, come back to me at the end, Mayor, for just a 10 second thing, but it's literally they're roofing the freeway. And then the idea is that people can then use that space. So it's a net gain for square footage for usable area. So it's, I think it's commercially interesting, but it would become, in effect, a tunnel. I think you're right. Let's just do that here, guys. I've, I've, I've uh, heard people have the concept that we should do the same thing on I-84 here, it's like around from about Jmar to Second Street, all of that cover, the freeway, and then there'd be all that space and you could make a park going all the way down to the waterfront <laughs> on top. Talk about expense. <laughs> right. anyway, um, Megan? Sorry, just <laughs> click the wrong <right> thing. <laughs> um, nothing major. I just, you know, we've had a lot of meetings in the last week, and I both the urban renewal and the work plan. I, I feel like I came away from both of those. Both we have a lot of work ahead, and also I'm super excited. It's all really awesome work. Um, so I'm just very excited to work with you all. Um, and kind of in that vein of things to work on, I this is I clearly don't quite remember what we decided at the last meeting, but what was kind of the next step on the public safety uh, discussions and, and getting a subcommittee together? Rachel. Mayor, if I could, that is on us. 
Okay. Um, it, it is on us to uh, talk to the county and figure out what that next step looks like, which is probably getting those small groups together. Okay, awesome. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't dropping a ball. So. Uh, you are not, and yes, that that's on us. Uh, I think it's fine. I mean, the county, I think, is still finishing up their strategic plan, so like, you know. No, oh, it's something we actually would like, it's timely and we would like to get started on it pretty soon. So more to come. Okay, awesome. Thank you. I'm going to call on Tim next, just in case you possibly fade away on us. <laughs> Go ahead. I've been having some interesting internet issues here. I've been accessing the meeting on several different devices all at the same time here. So, but no, I, I, I really don't have anything uh, other than to echo uh, Megan's uh, sentiment that uh, I'm looking forward to to working with everybody this year. And <clears throat> it really, uh, it is a lot of work, but it, it also presents some really exciting opportunities. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Gladys? Thank you, Mayor. Yes, I too uh, am excited about our our year together and it's a lot of hard work, but I definitely believe that we can all do this together. Uh, because of that, I just simply want to take the time to read a couple, little bit of our um, racial and social equity resolution that we created back in July. So I just want to read a portion of it. Um, now, therefore, it be resolved the city council acknowledges that systemic racism and institutional inequities harm black, indigenous, and other people of color in our community. And the city supports the goal of systemic change to achieve racial and social equity in our community. Be it further resolved that the city of Hood River commits to eliminating racial and social inequities within our staff, volunteers, and elected officials. The city will continue to listen, grow, and work towards equity and justice. The city council, the Hood River City Council, acknowledges that this is a goal without an endpoint. It's a goal without an endpoint. So it means that we're going to continue working on this over and over and over again. That we're going to see the world through this lens of social inequity. So I won't continue to read any further, but there is no end point. So therefore, we can never stop. Uh, and I just wanted to remind us of that as we go into the year with all of the work that we have to do. Thank you. Thank you, Gladys. Jessica? Uh, I don't have anything other than to thank the mayor and Rachel and all the staff that uh, were involved with the, um, the, the annual work plan meeting. I thought that was a really great meeting and like others, I was very excited after that. So thank you. Mark? Yeah, just uh, again to echo that, it's, it takes a tremendous amount of work to prepare for the for the Saturday meeting and the Thursday meeting before that and the five o'clock meeting before this. So, so um, it, it's, it's, it's really great. And, and everyone that I've been hearing messages from on council and, and beyond has has been excited about um, the outcome of those things. So, so um, thank you, Rachel, and your team, and um, go go council. Uh, and then lastly, I think Eric uh, toll booth at Viento for everyone coming eastbound is what we need to work on next. Is is uh, the, the... there you go? <laughs> You're going to be very unpopular, Mark. I I will take that. Yeah, yeah. Um, a couple of the things I've been um, working on, um, Energy Council, I think they are going to put together a letter to see if we would support um, sending that into the state to um, support the building codes coming up with a REACH code um, that we could adopt if we desire to. So it's not, we don't have to do any work uh, on our part. Um, they don't have the REACH code yet. But if they get it developed, then we could decide whether we wanted to um, adopt it or give give incentives, basically, uh, for builders to to strive to do that. So I think that that might be the next thing coming to us from them. 
as I said before, I'm going to be on radio, radio tier. I think it's the 20th or the 22nd. Um, and then the other thing is the Bi-State Working Group, speaking of toll bridges or tolls in general, um, the Bi-State Working Group um, had a presentation that was about three hours long on Friday. And I think the uh, recording of that is going to be on the port website within the next few days. It was a, a YouTube. And it's very interesting. So if anyone listening to this or any counselors want to um, listen to that, those presentations, they had uh, public entities, they were called um, well, owners maybe, um, such as it might've been a port or something like that, or a, the state of Colorado um, has worked with private companies. So this was a presentation on, on the private public partnership and how they work. And so, and then there were actually two entities that actually do that work. They're like contractors that hire the actual builders to build um, the new bridge. And it was a very interesting, there was uh, questions about tolling and how it works. And there's uh, one that was built that said that, that it had a local, local option, so to speak, for people that were local, that was a different toll rate than others. Um, so, you know, there's all sorts of things on the table right now. And so if anyone would like to listen to that, it's, it is a lengthy presentation, but there's a lot of information in it. And I think as we get closer to what we might be deciding to do um, through the Bi-State Working Group, which would be the city and the county and the port and the um, city and county across the river, um, it'll be important that we all kind of know what those narratives are going to be once we make those decisions so we can spread the word to the public about how it will work. So it's just good, um, just good information to have. We don't know if we're going to go that direction, but there's a lot of good information that came out of that meeting. So I'd encourage people to listen to that if you have time or listen to part of it anyway. So um, I think that's all I have. Um, Eric? Yes, if I could, if you will just indulge me. I'm going to share screen for these uh, highway covers. And as I'm doing this, I will let me just also say, Councilor Rivera's comments tonight, I just thought in council call were very well said. The way you put that, Councilor, that we, it's the project is unending. I thought I just would like to join in those comments. Um, um, but do you see the highway covers there? Oh, yeah. So those, that's the vision. That's what we're going to we as a state are going to spend over $400 million to create a tax collection system to build that. So um, there you go. Um, highway covers around the Rose Quarter. The other thing I'll mention about this, just so there's no ambiguity, it's not like Mike or the committee I'm on is somehow deciding to tow tolling. ODOT's not even deciding to do tolling. There's been a legislative direction to, to instruct ODOT to set up tolling. So it's a legislative decision at the state level, not ODOT or certainly not the ACT. But that's what we will hopefully have one, have, have one day as you drive to Portland. Well, you'll see in this presentation, if you listen to the presentation, there are lots of places that are doing um, these partnerships because the states and the feds don't have the money to give to the to the states to build this stuff, they just there is there isn't any money, and so that is the reason that these toll these tolls are coming <laughs> coming forth um, is because of that. And apparently, at least um, the presentation by the person from Colorado, they have um, kind of some expressways, I'll call them, that kind of run on the outside of Denver that are tolled. But they are used because they people do not want to be stuck in the gridlock inside the city, and they are happy to pay those tolls um, to be able to use those roads. So um, it, it's it's worked there. Yeah, that that was one other thing I wanted to mention is that the idea of the tolls in Portland is not just to raise money to build those things. It's actually by design meant to deter use, and that's they're completely overt about that as an objective. To, to get the congestion down. Yeah, and the and these toll roads are, you know, there people were willing to pay the fee to 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 be able to get from one place to the next in less amount of time. So, 
All right, uh, I think that's it. Thank you, everyone. We will see you in a couple weeks. <laughs>